I'm here again today with Glenn, and we are going to be talking about the Jordan Peterson Lawrence Krauss conversation from the standpoint of physics. And uh, Glenn has a very interesting idea about how, how some of this ties together with Cesar Hidalgo's ideas on trust networks. So Glenn, I'm gonna let you take the ball and um, then we'll see if we can look at some of these video clips. Okay, well, we're back to the, the Lawrence Krauss, Jordan Peterson talk. And as a physics math person, a number of um, things were said, which really set up some red flags for me. I'll cover those and One of them, well, God, no, I've just lost my train of thought. So we'll go through um, a number of the selections on YouTube that I've picked out that I think are important. Mm -hmm. And then I'll spend some time discussing, um, amplifying, unpacking these ideas that are there. And then we'll finally get to a conclusion at the end with the observation that all of these various topics that might not seem like they have anything to do with each other all come together under the heading of trust networks. Um, Cesar Dalgo is an economist uh, at, at MIT. And uh, so a lot of his ideas are based on a very practical world of e economics, economics, but his ideas apply to social networks in general. So without, without further ado, if you kind of roll that first clip. Okay, I'm gonna share a screen here, roll the first clip. Um... And well, of course, things always happen when we try to do this. Um, mm -hmm. And let's try again. Well, or maybe maybe I should do Spider Man. With great power comes great responsibility. But but um, which may be a summary of your book. But anyway, um, uh, the. We have this weird, like, I can't agree with you more. We have this weird dichotomy. We've discovered science. The, the scientific method was a discovery. It took a while to discover it. When the Greeks didn't have it, they did a lot. But if they'd been able to know about empirical evidence, they would have done a lot more. Um, and so it was a discovery. And it's a discovery that was incredibly powerful that works. But we humans, you know, um, didn't evolve uh, and didn't evolve to discover the scientific method. I mean, we had the capability. And therefore, we have all sorts of evolutionary baggage that. So is that about what you want me yes, to stop? That was it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Did you want to make any comment on this before we watch the second clip? Uh, yeah, I'd like to comment on this one a, a lot. He's, he seems like he's, he's suggesting that the Greeks didn't know about the scientific method. In fact, uh, that that's a recent discovery that somehow we have that those old people didn't. And I find that quite um, amazing that he could make that statement where the idea that we didn't evolve as humans to, to discover the scientific method. First off, we wouldn't be here if our ancient ancestors hadn't paid attention to the, the natural world around them, learned some hard lessons, you know, through trial and error, and incorporated those lessons into their culture and then handed that, those lessons down in their traditions and their oral histories. So humans have always been paying attention to their environment, making guesses, making tests. You know, it's, it's the, the, the famous hold my beer while I try this kind of thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have always been doing that and we've learned and grown. And if, Lawrence Krauss is, is meaning anything, he must be pointing to the modern version of the scientific method where we have labs and, and technology and equipment and journals. Well, no, the Greeks really didn't have that, but there's a reason why. And it wasn't because they didn't discover this scientific method. And this gets to the importance of technology in human history actually, not just um, science. And I think history is written by academics. And for the most part, they're not people who are grounded in the day-to-day -day life of, 
of farming or driving a truck or um, building a ship, whatever. And so they, they don't take the presence of technology, available technologies into consideration in how the flow of history goes. Um, one of the things I was introduced to um, in that great um, book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, was that there was a whole cluster of Greek philosophers before Socrates and Plato. And one of the things they had in common, you know, to put it in my own words, is they felt that the proper life for a man, moral life, was one that was lived in harmony with nature. And so the earliest Greek philosophers were, in a sense, natural philosophers. They were physicists in our, in our terms. They tried, they asked questions, they explored. But the reason they couldn't go farther is because they didn't have the tools to do the experiments to check their theories. So all they could do is sit and argue and talk. But if you look at what the Greeks managed to do with what they had to work with, I mean, simple string and um, stick and string astronomy, they were able to calculate uh, the circumference of the earth. Uh, that was almost 2000 years ago. Yeah, 2000 years ago. Uh, and one of the numbers that in our modern units was like 25,000 miles. So they were pretty close. Um, they did a lot with math and astronomy which again is something that you could do. Uh, if you look at the works of Ptolemy, which I think was published in around the second century AD, in, in a modern book form, it's like four or 500 pages of nothing but math, lookup tables, geometric constructions, and, you know, and it was all aimed at mapping the orbits of the planets. You would have to have at least uh, undergraduate intro level in physics or math to get through that book that was goes back to shortly after the time of Jesus. It was, and if you look up um, on the internet, some of the, the Greek accomplishments going back to the early centuries, it was amazing. I, they postulated atoms, the first ones to, to guess that the sun was the center of the solar system and not the earth. Uh, they were even aware of fossils, you know, and well, since there's fossils in the mountains, the mountains must have been below the water. And you, you look at some of the work and you go, wow, if you just had access to research tools that we take for granted today, they could have launched. I, I think given the Greeks, you know, if they'd had what we had, they would have been on the moon by the second century AD, but they didn't have the technology <laughs> to do the experiments to, to further the science. So in a sense, Greek science died or puttered out long before Christianity ever showed up. You know, I've, I've heard the term, the, the Christian dark ages to refer to how the, the lack of science uh, throughout the middle and early, you know, the post-Roman years, and somehow that was the fault of Christianity. But if you look historically, uh, Greek science um, came to an end long before the, you know, centuries before Christianity came into being. And the reason was the lack of technology to do the experiments. So if you fast forward, um, we don't see the Western world finally reaching and passing the Greeks until the time of Galileo. And I'll use him as, as, a, as a mile marker, but there was a whole um, zeitgeist around Galileo when things all of a sudden changed and took off. And you have to ask yourself, in what sense, what did Galileo have that the Greeks didn't? Um, he had a telescope. <laughs> he had the telescope, but why did he have the telescope? Because someone was making uh, spectacles, glasses to read with. Why was someone making spectacles for for people to read unless all of a sudden now there was a critical number of people in society who were interested in reading. So um, I didn't look it up, but I think the first, um, what we would call reading glasses was maybe the 13th, 12th, 13th century. So now you have this technology, you have a market where people have a reason to think that reading is important and you have these glasses. So now you have reason to make optical quality glass. You have uh, a reason for people to learn how to master the art of making lenses of optical quality, mounting them. 
And then now after you've made these glass, these lenses and you start playing with them and then you realize, well, if I hold up two lenses just right, it, it magnifies things in the distance. So Galileo picked up on that, but he wouldn't have done that if there wasn't this whole chain of technology and developments and the free exchange of money. I mean, none of this would have happened if there hadn't been a, an open economy that would allow uh, these industries, these crafts to grow and develop. So he took this notion of lenses and because he was interested in astronomy, I think it sparked him because he probably thought, well, I could look at the moon now. And he pushed the envelope and mastered the art of making optical quality astronomical lenses. Probably, I think the first one was maybe two inches in diameter or something. And then he actually ended up making a business. I think he had a side business making astronomical telescopes besides everything else he did. He was quite the character. But that would have never happened if all of this other stuff wasn't there. And then once he made the optical telescope, the ocean, the captains at sea picked it up, you know, military, it took off. So there's this whole chain of command um, of, of technology growing and underneath that kind of technology, there has to be a trust network. There has to be a, a free exchange of money and ideas. And that's all based on a trust element between elements of society. So that's the first hint of what's going on. The Greeks didn't have that. They didn't have the extensive, uh, there wasn't a reason for people to, to master these crafts that eventually would give rise to um, the telescope. The, the number system we use, the, the zero through nine um, uh, numbers, the decimal number system that, that came out of India, even though it's called the Arabic numerals. They, and it began in India, possibly the reason why is there was a merchant class that had a reason to start doing math. Uh, historically before the people who did math were, were like scribes. They were a special elite group of people within a society or within, a, that, that's what they did, numbers. And um, some of the early um, calculations were done on, a, it's called a counting table which would be a large version of the abacus. So they would take like in the Roman numerals, they would take the Roman numerals, turn it into um, beads on the counting table, do the math, and then turn it back into Roman numerals. The zero through nine number system we have is just a shorthand way of writing what's on a counting table. So now all of a sudden you don't need a counting table, you don't need, uh, a calculator, uh, someone who does numbers, you can do it yourself with a stick on some sand. And actually some of the early people thought that the way we do math today was magic because you could just do all this math by manipulating symbols on, on a piece of paper or chalkboard. But anyway, the number system arose because there was the commercial need for it um, that was arising from the masses. And so it was democratized it. It took it away from the elite, the priesthood. The... And so the reading became the same way, I think, in, in the West. And so we see this constant um, uh, progression of technology based on um, the ideas of, I don't know, scholasticism or just exploring the world of curiosity, seeping down from the elites down into the masses. Um, the other technology that Galileo had that the Greeks didn't have was artillery. So the invention of gunpowder had come in a few centuries earlier. And so by the time Galileo came on the scene, uh, artillery was important. And that was one of the first things he taught. We always think of him as astronomy. And, but as a college a university instructor, some of his duties were artillery, uh, fortifications, uh, math, which in those days was astronomy associated with astrology. But you look at Aristotle's versions of physics on how motion of objects. Well, once you start shooting cannonballs and you have to figure out exactly where the cannonball is gonna go, you're forced to think about the motion of bodies on the earth. And that became in, in 
complete contradiction to what Aristotle had taught. And so I think Galileo's first struggle, and in fact, his, his struggle through his whole career was not with the church, it was with Aristotle and the Aristotelian thinking, the stranglehold it had on scientific. And so like he famously dropped the two balls off the, the tower, leaning tower pizza, and whether it's true or not, but he showed that weight didn't matter. This, you know, the balls that hit the ground at the same time. So he was concerned with the flight of objects through space and Aristotle didn't do it. The professors made fun of him. And he says, no, look, see, Aristotle's wrong. And he just did the experiment. Uh, apparently he was somewhat popular with his students because he made some of the other professors look silly. There was a, a strong element of professional jealousy against him. I believe the first people to raise the religious arguments against Galileo actually came from the, the philosophy department <laughs> at the university, not from the church. But that's a story for another day. If you look at Tycho Brahe did all of the initial work that Johannes Kepler finally was able to realize that the motion of the planets was ellipse, ellipses rather than circles. So, um, but Tycho Brahe's work was based on doing astrology for very rich people. And at one point, um, he had a, an island observatory up in Denmark. I think it was uh, Uraniborg. Um, and it was funded by the Danish government. And I believe it was like 1%, something of the total Danish budget went to support his um, observ observatory. Yeah. And then, so that points back to astronomy has always been big science, you know. Um, the work that Taco Brahe did was the equivalent of LHC um, in his day in terms of national expenditures, which again is another reason why the Greeks couldn't do the experiments that they would have needed to do to go forward because the budget wasn't there. The, the Zoroastrians, that, that group over in the Persia, what we would call Persia today, they did believe that the motion of the planets affected us. So they had a priesthood that kept track of the motion of the planets. So now you have a, um, a reason to, to budget for a priesthood that will maintain observatories over generations and keep records. So the Persians have a long record going back, you know, before uh, Christ on, on astronomy. In fact, I think the Magi, the, the three wise men that show up in uh, the Christmas story, where were Zoroastrian priests. Um, they fit that, that mold perfectly. But in the Greek world, the money wasn't there. And you fast forward to the Christian times, we Christians don't believe that the, the planets and the stars have anything to do with our, our future. So there's no incentive to budget that kind of money that would have taken to do the astronomy that required the math. So everything petered out on, on, on that front. So it wasn't until the invention of artillery that the West finally had a reason to uh, go back to doing math again. But the point in all this is the Greeks were not slouches. They had it. A lot of the scientific method depends entirely on technology. Technology is driven by the available economy, the available wealth the desire of the society that thinks it's something like learning or reading or doing astronomy is important enough to commit budgets to. Um, all of this ultimately depends on a trust network. And this is what uh, the economist Cesar Hidalgo is getting at is economies depend on trust networks that you can only grow so big depending on the size of how big your trust network goes. Um, so I think that covers that. If you want to play the next uh, clip from Lawrence Krauss. Yeah, I do. Before before we jump from this, though, I just want to make a couple of comments. I'm just going to stick them in here. You, I mean, yeah, go, go nobody has it. to respond or think about it or anything else. But a couple things occurred to me. One is when you were talking about the pre-Socratic philosophers, <clears throat> I was recently reading about Heraclitus, and he had this theory that everything was fire 
-hmm. that the beginning of everything was fire. And I mean, how he ever came up with that, I have no idea. But really, isn't that, I mean, if the Big Bang, I know there's some dispute now about whether there was a big bang or whether it's a bounce or you know all these yeah. other ideas that people have come up with but but if it was a big bang then the beginning was like immensely 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 hot like a big fire like mm-hmm. so so those guys were thinking way beyond what most of us think today we i mean we yeah. don't we don't ponder those things unless we're studying them for some reason but but those guys just thought about how the world laid itself out and and even many of the very early thinkers came up with the ideas of atoms that were all made of particles i mean how where did they come up with that when you look at the world you can't see that but they reasoned it through which meant that they were trying to make observations and trying to understand what it was that they were seeing okay the second thing i wanted to say is that you talked about the need for lenses when people began to want to read There's several things there. One of the things is one of the things that people most wanted to read was the Bible, right? Right. And the other thing is that may have been it, or it may have been that people's eyes started getting worse and therefore lenses were needed because that was about the time that we started having access to large quantities of sugar because of the trade routes and everything and, and sugar was a big driver of diabetes and diabetes is a big driver of loss of eyesight Mm -hmm. if it's not handled and and of course they didn't have medical technology in those days to handle it so it may have been that people's eyesight was getting worse and that's why they needed the lenses so there could be a lot of things that uh, you know what you're basically saying is there are many 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 effects that are going together to create a result and we have no Mm -hmm. idea what all those effects were but Lawrence Krauss acts as if it's this simplistic, you know, absolutely this one thing that he's talking about. Yeah, well, I'm sure it's a lot of factors that people were living longer, probably that uh, they had more free time. Um, life was a little more stable. So you, as you got into your older age, instead of just working until you drop dead, maybe there's a window of time when you would spend, you know, maybe read, like you say, reading the Bible or um exchanging in conversations, uh, wondering about the universe. Um, mm-hmm. that, that wonderment, uh, we'll get to that at the end of this, that it seems to be an element in a number of, of uh, people. I'm not sure everyone has it, but we'll, we'll, we'll definitely get back to this one. Yeah, and the other thing is when you, when you mentioned that the, the uh, scientific method basically has always been around well of course i mean even when you look at what cognitive neuroscientists are doing they're talking about your your brain is made up of this predictive mechanism you're always looking predicting trying to figure out what's going on so that you know what to do next and mm-hmm. i mean that's the scientific method it's just been codified in a certain way for our right. time and history so okay i'm going to go to the next um clip which is at 147.10. So let me share screen for us. About 25 seconds at this one. Yeah. 47.10, here we go. I'm believers and we, we spent a lot of time together. And I think our f- views have, have come together in different ways. I would argue that religion on the whole has not been a good thing for people. Okay, that's the first argument. But but in order to but we shouldn't realize, we have to realize that in order that it does serve an evolutionary purpose, if you want to call it purpose. It's there because it it has it has sur- it, it has survived all of societies because it does it meets some human needs in one way or another. And therefore we have to ask what needs does it satisfy and realize and what why? they are and how can we okay, right how there. can we provide them without the fairy tales so- that you want to stop there yeah that's that's perfect okay. spot so yeah this one really sticks in my craw as they would say <laughs> that he, he dismisses the religion so completely but here he sits on the top of a giant 
technological, economic, social pyramid. I mean, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, for instance, which is doing kind of the research, research that he is, he's involved with, tens of billions of dollars, 20, 30 years from its first initial um, you know, idea on a drawing board to up and running. Probably tens of thousands of people, if you count scientists, you know, physicists, uh, technicians, all the way down to cement truck drivers hauling concrete. Uh, you need that all of this giant pyramid that the LHC sits on top of, you know, and to all the people, they have to go to the grocery stores, they have to buy houses, there's road systems. What keeps society all together? What keeps that giant pyramid together that supports his scientific, his physics world? And that's where the trust networks come in. Some kind of, there has to be some complex of trust networks that hold this whole society thing together all the way down to the street sweepers and the garbage collectors and the people who pick crops in the field. And religion, has served that function. And so for him to be that, to write it off so easily really bugs me. Yeah, there's a lot of things that you can point to that have been bad and a lot of evil been, has been done in the name of religion. But in the end of the day, religion or Judeo-Christianity for us in the West has been that glue that has held us all together so that we can develop the technologies economies and everything to give the world that he has. So in one of the senses, that's how modern science has come out of the Christian faith. Um, Jordan Peterson picks up on it, but we're, I'm going to nail, drill down on it more later. So well, so when when you were describing this, this pyramid upon which the LHC sits, that in itself is a, a religion basically, because all of these people have put their hopes in this thing that is going to find this, the answers for them, the solution for them. And, um, and it is probably, it, it may be equally probable that the answer does lie there or the answer doesn't lie there. So they've, they've, they've got mm -hmm. a theory and, and they put all of this money and effort and worship towards this theory. I mean, countless numbers of young people have put their lives into just studying so that they can do that thing and and are striving for the top of this pyramid and uh that's a religion just as like any any other religion and he he attributes the the kinds of religions that that humans tend to, you know, like, uh, let's say the Judeo-Christian thing, he attributes that to superstition. But it's just as likely that some of these scientific theories that have not panned out, but that have taken long swaths of time and huge amounts of money to follow the trail, you could call that superstition too, if you wanted to. I mean, mm -hmm. he's just using words. He's not, he's not really exploring ideas to any depth at all. So yeah, I understand why it tripped your trigger. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get we'll get back to this when we, we touch on NEMA in a little while because in a lot of ways Lawrence Krauss isn't even wrong as one famous physicist famously described a paper. But we need to really take all of that that's been discussed, push it off the table and start fresh. And that's what I want to do as a conclusion to this talk. But forming hypothesis, making tests, um, seeing what works, what doesn't, our hunter-gatherer ancestors did that. And if they weren't good at it, you know, Darwin um, was, was brutally efficient at weeding out people who didn't get it right. So to say that our experience has no basis in um, physical truth, reality, is doesn't make sense to me. How, as a physicist, he could even say that? Um, if you're going to build a trust network in the Caesar Hidalgo sense, that spans not just you know cultural boundaries and 
geographic boundaries, but time as well, generational boundaries, then it has to be something tied to something that goes beyond just the, the moment, the here and now. If you could tie a trust network to physical reality, uh, you know, Nima calls it capital T truth. If in the end, your trust network is, is sourced on that, then it is robust and it will last. And so what you're seeing with Christianity and the fact that Judeo-Christianity, going back to the, the, the Jewish culture, I mean, it's been around 3000 years. It's a trust network. We call it a religion, but it encapsulates a trust network. It's been with us for at least three millennia. That should tell you that it's doing something right. If you believe in Darwin and that Darwin selects out the people who get it right and gets rid of those who don't, then the fact that it's still, I'm sorry, Lawrence, there's something there that's real. Maybe you're not seeing it. Maybe you need to go back and take another look. But I do believe Jordan Peterson's picked up on it and he's, he's trying to articulate it, but it's clear that's what's motivating him through all of these talks. So I think we can go on to the next um, one now. Next video this clip. Is, this, is this the clip where Lawrence is talking? Uh, I mean, this, where, where this is the clip where, where Jordan is talking? Jordan Peterson is talking, yes. It's about okay. a minute long. Okay, at one, and that's at 149.35. Uh, you know, your heart allows okay, your so, body so, to just... Okay, so, all right, so let, let me respond to that a bit. And I, I understand your point I, and, and take it very seriously. And so, but what I've been looking at, because I do look at this biologically to begin with, because I, I, I try to look at things scientifically insofar as the science allows those things to be viewed. Okay. Well, and so to the that. degree that I can look at religious matters from a biological perspective, I do that because it's simpler. Okay. So okay. I believe that the religious instinct manifests itself in a variety of fundamental uh, uh, motivations, but they're, they're, they're abstract motivations to some degree. So the experience of awe, mm -hmm. that's a major one. The, the experience of beauty, Mm -hmm. That's another one. The, the experience of admiration and the desire to imitate, those are, those are crucial. And so, so one of the things that I would point out, you can tell me what you think about this, and, and I've been trying to formalize this idea, enough. and I don't know what it's... Okay, so you want to stop there? Right, and now contrast this with, with Nima Harkani's uh, beginning of his talk. Okay, and, and I, I, I've got that set up too, so we'll okay, go Okay, so that's from, from two minutes to four and a half minutes. Yeah, we'll go back to share screen. I need to uh, get to Nima. Oh, the two minute one, okay. Mm -hmm. It's going to kick in here in a second, I think. Okay. Well, that's peculiar. Um, part of the reason for it is that... Uh, I'm going to back it up here. Back it up. Talk is that like, like many physicists, um, uh, many scientists, uh, I'm, I'm an atheist. Uh, but uh, unlike some atheists, I'm certainly not a militant atheist, and I, and I, I dislike a lot a certain uh, strand of... Uh, of uh, militant atheism. Um, part of the reason for it is that uh, there is an experience you get. There, there, are, there are many very negative things associated with, uh, with the religion. As, a, as someone who um, spent a, a good fraction of my childhood in post-revolutionary uh, Islamic Iran, I can tell you that uh, I've experienced firsthand what some of the horrible aspects of uh, extreme uh, religious fanaticism can be like. But on the other hand, there are amazing things about some aspects of religion. When you go to these incredible cathedrals in Europe, uh, you're absolutely filled with a feeling of awe 
and uh, sort of a transcendent experience that's available to everybody. It's available to absolutely everybody. And it's extremely important, and it feels important to have a contact with something much, much larger than, than yourself. So it's often said that uh, if, we, if we take that away, if we take away some large thing out there um, that cares about us, that has some relationship to us, then, uh, then there's less meaning in the world. And often, you know, some secular humanists will say, well, uh, there, there is no invariant meaning. There is a big impersonal universe out there. There is no invariant meaning. And we have to decide for ourselves how to behave, what good behavior is, what bad behavior is, and so on. That it's ultimately some you know, social construct and a decision between ourselves about how to go about doing things. And that's always struck me as a little hollow. And, um, and, and, and it doesn't feel right. And part of the reason that it doesn't feel right is that uh, we actually get in our, in our business, just in the day-to-day -day part of doing it, not just in gaping in awe at the mysteries of nature, but actually in the business of going about doing physics, in the business of going about doing science, uh, we get a, a lot of this kind of experience. We have the feeling that we're interacting with something much vaster than ourselves, that, much, that knows much more than us what's going on, and that if we interact with it properly, tells us what to do next and sort of improves us and makes us better. Uh, we get that experience day to day as a, as a routine part of our lives. And um, that's what I want to tell you about today and uh, make an argument that there is something in the structure of... I, I just love the way he talks and how that can be, um, how he can be saying that he's an atheist and then talk that way is very, you know, very interesting. <laughs> well, um, I, I really like Nima because he's really touched on the way I approach physics. And I, I think if Jordan Peterson should talk to anybody, it would be Nima, not Lawrence Krauss. Yeah. Um, and the reason why is for me, I realize that physics my love of physics begins with, with wonder and curiosity. This, this feeling there's something out there and I want to know. I want to engage with it. And as I grew, you know, as matured over the years as a Christian, I realized that my Christian faith came from the same place. The sense that there's something bigger out there, more important, something I'm part of. It's wonderful. And so to me, my Christian faith and my love of physics and my are the same thing. Uh, unfortunately, I've been taught all these years in the church that they're not. There are two different things, science and, and faith. No. Nima gets it, but he's not going to confess his faith as a Christian or anything else, obviously, because of his really negative experience. Jordan Peters, I think, is in the same boat. He's, he's discovered the transcendent through a different pathway. And now people want him to act like a Christian and he can't. But that doesn't mean that his impulse is coming from a different place. Um, so that's why I like um, about Nemo. And I think it's important to really realize that the proper doing of science start from the same place that faith starts from, that there's something bigger out there that, that we're part of, that we can know, that, that will guide us if we pay attention to it, um, pulls us forward. So the Greeks had it. Why, why worry about fossils in the mountains? Why worry about atoms? Unless there was something there in their spirit, curiosity pulling them forward. And I think that's the intriguing thing about the, us as humans, that, some people have it, some, and some people have no curiosity. I think Lawrence um, Krauss is one of those people who have no curiosity, and, I, and it makes me sad. Um, and that curiosity is what pulls us forward, uh, both in science and in faith. Uh, so that's, um, I think that encapsulates what I had to say there. Uh, the next step, I think, is um, Jordan Peterson's comment on Israel. Uh, it starts at about 150.35. Okay. So 
I look at Christianity in particular, although not uniquely Christianity, but Christianity in particular, as a, a thousands of years uh, investigation into the structure of the abstracted ideal to imitate. So imagine we imitate those we admire. Okay, mm -hmm. but we're abstract creatures, so we want to know what's the essence of what should be imitated itself. Mm -hmm. Now, we investigate that. It's not all explicit. We have to represent it in music. We have to represent it in art. We have to represent it in architecture because we're, we're, we're hitting at it from multiple different domains. And that is a reductionistic okay. argument, right? It has, says nothing. That's, yeah. Now, let's, uh, we can contrast this with what Nima is talking about. And it might seem a little bit of a stretch, but they're they're hitting on the same thing so this is nemus that starts at uh, five minutes 15 seconds Five fifteen. yep okay and goes for about almost two so nema at five fifteen. thank you for getting all these time stamps by the way yeah talk about so just repeating some of the things i said right at the start in science and math, we have an objective notion of right and wrong. Um, in science, there is a world outside, and we think we're learning more about the world, and ultimately, the agreement of our theories and explanations for what's going on with experiments we do decides who's right and who's wrong. Uh, it's not a social construct. Uh, perhaps more obviously in mathematics, there's a notion of right and wrong, and it's a fascinating thing, especially about uh, the structure of physical laws, that they're expressed in fundamentally mathematical language so that these two notions of right and wrong uh, meld with each other in an interesting way. And our central obsession, again, unstated, so implicit, so in the air we breathe that we don't rhapsodize about it all the time, is that we think there is a truth out there with a capital T and, uh, and we want to find it. Okay? Um, so that truth of the capital T is going to be uh, appearing everywhere else in, in the rest of the talk. Now, the, the interesting point is that over a period of centuries, uh, we have found that the most successful way for human beings to discover these truths uh, is associated with certain patterns of behavior, uh, a right way of doing things, and a kind of intellectual moral code. So this is not a moral code about how human beings should treat each other, how to be good people, or anything like that. It's a very sort of mercenary, selfish thing, OK? As, as, uh, as scientists, as physicists, and uh, and uh, mathematicians, um, we want to get after, after this truth. There's various strategies for going about doing it, and some of those strategies prove more successful than others. Okay? And just as a mercenary fact, our desire to get to the answers more quickly, to understand them more deeply, turns out the most successful ways of doing this turns out to be associated with a certain uh, uh, sort of intellectual moral code. Do you want to stop there? Yeah, yeah that's a good place to stop. OK. So what Jordan Peterson is, is pointing out is that the, the Judeo, you know, the, the Old Testament is basically a thousand plus year record of a group of people struggling to figure out what works and what doesn't. There's experiments, there's failures, there's successes. The Jewish people were establishing what we, what Cesar Hidalgo would call their trust network. They're setting up a, a set of rules. What's important, what isn't? How do we treat each other if, we're, if we want to succeed um, as a culture? And notice, Nima is talking about individuals' decisions. So if you're gonna pursue science, then truth better be come before anything. You know, the minute you start using science as a tool for a personal you know, benefit or whatever, you've lost the game. But if a society, a culture, a group of people choose to pursue the truth together, then you all of a sudden get a different set of rules apply to how people treat each other. So Nima's rules on how to be a good scientist then translate to rules on how to be a good society. If you want to build a trust network based on some kind of capital T truth that's sitting out there, and it's like I've pointed, you know, one makes 
the point is that if you believe in Darwin, you believe in Darwinian selection, that it will pick out the winners over the losers. And if you, it's a safe assumption that the societies whose truth networks are tied to capital T truth in one way or another will be the ones most successful, then you have to believe that the Jewish people got something right. So now you have to wonder what is that they got right. Um, we, I'm not sure religion, uh, theology. That's not um, the, the the forum to discuss these. But I think there's something more fundamental going on, and I think we see it show up in that longing for a capital T truth that comes through in physics, and comes through in a Christian, a simple Christian faith that involves that longing for something greater, to be part of that, whatever it is that's out there. And at one point, I think Jordan Peterson has talked and Lawrence Krauss are talking about how modern science grew out of Christianity. I'm not sure that's the words um, I would use. I think that notion of coming out or maybe Christian faith being the, the seedbed, uh, that seems natural, but I think it's more correct to say that the longing for capital T truth is inherent in some of us. And sometimes it is inherent in, in enough people that we actually form a society or cluster or community around it. And that's that longing is what you see coming out of the Christian faith that, and shows up in pursuit of science as well. And I would say that's a healthy faith, a healthy pursuit of science, both um, start from that longing, but you can do a lot of corruption uh, uh, on the path there. And so when you were talking about how the LHC is a religion, for some people it's been corrupted into that, but somewhere deep down inside of a lot of people, it, it starts with a longing for to be part of whatever it is that's out there. And Along the way, it gets corrupted by money and politics and who knows all, because we're imperfect, finite creatures. And in Nima's talk, he, he goes into that, the, the sort of disciplines you have to do as an imperfect creature if you want to approach physics in terms of capital T truth. And one of those is, is you have to be hold the truth sacred at all costs. Well, when I was talking about the LHC as a religion, I wasn't saying that that there's anything corrupt about it at this point or anything like that i was just saying that it is a religion based on an idea that could potentially turn out to be a wrong idea oh yeah right? it, it because it's it's science because it's falsifiable which means that it may be true it may be false and, but they've put all this money and effort into it and, and all of this structure supporting it. So it, it just seemed as much of a religion as any other. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not- yeah, I know exactly what you yeah. mean. And I, and I, I, I know how people see it. For some people like the Lawrence Krauss's, science has become an alternative because they think they can prove that religion is stupid and dumb. And then- mm -hmm. um, then you get into the, the politics and the money. You think of all the money, the grad students, the, the grants, the research papers. There's a whole financial mechanism that has gotten involved in the pursuit of science, which has better people than me have pointed it out that um, the whole grant process is, is really corrupted. But somewhere deep down inside, there is um, a longing for the truth. Mm -hmm. We'll never get it. We'll never know it completely, but we can approach it. And part of that is making guesses, trying, pushing the envelope. And uh, generally the history of science going back to the Greeks is that eventually we're always wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so well, so, and, I, and I didn't want to derail us on the, the issue of trust when you were talking about, um, you were exploring that so beautifully. And it reminded me of the conversation I had yesterday with Mark Lefevre about the conversation Jordan Peterson had had with John Verbeke. Because mm -hmm. there's a point in that conversation where, where they're talking about 
the meaningfulness that comes out of conversations and they're trying to approach what love means. And Jordan says, well, so, so that's, that's trust. Then you trust the honesty in the other. And, um, and he goes on and the kind of language that he's using, it's obvious that when he says honesty, he means truth. Mm -hmm. And when he means truth, that he's always talking about the truth being that which brings good out, brings order out of the chaos, right? right? And so, you know, he's talking about that kind of truth. And then he lines that up with, with agape, with love. And so, so they're coming into this alignment where truth and reality and agape are all kind of lined up. And, and when Nima Arkani Hamed is talking, it sounds very much like that is the kind of the truth that's that's beyond our understanding. It's way up above the top of whatever hierarchy mm -hmm. we could accomplish here. But it sounds like that's what Nima Arkani Hamed is also talking about. Because he... In, in, in another place in that video, which I just love, he's talking about the, the local perfection of ideas that have been crystallized, like um, Newton's theories. It's a, it's a beautiful top of a mountain peak. And from there, you have a perspective of, of all this wonder and everything. And it allows you to do a lot of things. But when you get to the next mountain peak, which is Einstein's theories, it's a higher mountain, you have a better perspective on things, but that does not diminish the local perfection of Newton's theories because mm -hmm. they still work in their sphere. And, and so you keep getting to these higher mountain peaks, which is this, this longing after higher and higher truths, right? Which is what keeps us moving. It's that little golden thread out in front of us. Yeah. So let's go to the next one, I think. Um, Jordan, Peterson. Jordan Peterson, okay. Yes. And it's, it's about 40 seconds. Jay pointed out that we derive our concepts from our practical, our practical manipulations of things. So for example, you know, you might ask why, well, why is this one thing? You know, I could yeah. say, well, it's five what things. things. Yeah. Okay. Well, the question is, well, what's a thing? Yeah. Well, look, it moves as a unit, therefore it's a thing. So that's one. Well, it could be five if I broke it apart. Yeah. Now yeah. it's two, yeah. but it's, it's, it, the, the concept itself is predicated on our interactions at this scale. And so we're going to derive our sense of reality from our practical interactions at this scale. And your claim, the claim of the quantum mechanics in general, is that that doesn't apply at the micro scale. In so our intuitions are gone because our intuitions are predicated on our embodiment at this level of analysis. Absolutely. Yes. In fact, the p purpose of the greatest story we're told so far, that particular... You want to stop there? Yes. Yeah. So... That's the infamous mysterious object. <laughs> you were trying to figure out what it was. But he lands on, on something that, about language, which has fascinated me because I'm, I'm working with machine intelligence and, and how do you talk to a computer? Um, our, our language has evolved through our interactions with the physical world around us, natural language. And he nails it exactly. Um, uh, starting from pack animals, wolves or you know, other animals, they have an emotive language. Any social creature is going to have some kind of language to keep the social co cohesion together. Somewhere along the way, humans, we got above the emotive part of a language or, and started acting, um, adding abstract objects. So our language by the very Darwinian selection has evolved to encapsulate the physical world around us correctly. So group animals, social animals that can communicate reliably with each other have a better chance of, of survival and passing that on. And groups that um, create a language which can be passed on from one generation to the next have even a higher um, Darwinian 
survival rate. So the point is, our natural language is intimately tied to the physical world around us. If it wasn't, we, we wouldn't be here, which is it's like one of the reasons why we can do word problems in math and physics, because it's that kind of structure is already there. So that's why language is so important. And when we get back to the truth networks, in a society, that's how, you know, if you go to a, a Google server farm, all the computers are tied together through, you know, network lines electronically. But as a society, what holds us together as a group are the communication links. And those are formed by, you know, talking, words, whether spoken or written. And so the Darwinian view, language and truth have a covenant together. If language is not tied to the truth, then you as a social group are gone. So coming into the picture, like I say, there's a covenant between truth and language, if you believe Darwin. And that covenant has to be held sacred if society as a whole is going to function. Because once you break that covenant and language is no longer truthful, can no longer be trusted, then everything falls apart. And those trust, we've talked about it before, carries um, an element of action, stepping out. Uh, you make a decision in trust that someone else will respond in a certain way. Once that trust is broken, um, everything falls apart. And that trust is based on, you know, the use of language is, in is embedded in that trust network. So that's why I think Jordan Peterson saw Bill C-16 as a hill to die on. Because once language is no longer trustworthy, in that sense, communication dies because you're afraid to talk in the first place. Um, Jordan Peterson talks about it. Nima Harkani talks about it. That we never really get to the truth, but we can approach it. And the way we do that is we exchange ideas. You know, if a physicist, you put up a theory, someone puts up another one, you argue, you, you go back and forth. And sometimes you're wrong, sometimes you're mistaken. But as long as people are honestly in good faith, communicating the best they understand about truth, and they're all working towards the same point, it works. But the minute you're afraid to say something because someone might be offended, it might be the wrong thing to say. The minute you are worried that you'll be punished if you say something wrong, that's when communication ends. That's when the trust network that holds society together starts to fragment. And when that goes, we actually lose our humanity in the process. So that's why I think Jordan Peterson is really on to something with, with, and it's not just here, but it, he said the same thing in other ways in other places that the use of language is absolutely essential. And the, to tie language to truth has to be there, otherwise we're lost. Anyway, I think that does that. If you want to. Yeah, I want to say something about this language yeah. thing before we move on. Because um, you brought up, uh, by, by discussing that, you've really brought up a much, much bigger, more fundamental issue in my mind. <clears throat> and that is, Yes, okay, Bill C-16 is a hill to die on, but that's partly because over the last, I, I don't even know how long, our language has become corrupted to the extent that it's very difficult to actually communicate truth anymore. And, and, I, and I miss even looking back to like Orwell, when Orwell had his essays on language and how some things have become cemented into the language that diminish the potential for meaning. Like so many cliches have become these ironclad things that maybe mean different things to different people. And yet we use them as though they have a common meaning. And mm -hmm. so we've lost a lot of flavor. Um, when you go back and you read the Greeks <laughs> thousands of years ago, they were so far intellectually superior to us in their capacity to articulate very deep ideas and to do so um, 
with a great economy of language. We've lost that economy of language because we've lost the meanings of so many words. And, and there's another guy who's been writing more recently, and that's Richard Mitchell. I, I don't even know if he's still alive, but there are a couple of his books that I really like. He used to have a a um, weekly column called The Underground Grammarian. But he has one book that's called Less Than Words Can Say that looks at how bureaucratic language has damaged our capacity to articulate ideas. If you just read the way grants are written or the way um, even scientific abstracts are written, they're so obfuscatious that they're not really saying anything. And um, we think we're communicating with each other, but we aren't really, which all gets all tied up with Barfield's idea of the evolution of consciousness as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that's a bigger idea that it's gonna take way more to unravel and really consider what it means to be an educated and articulate person and be able to communicate ideas with clarity and concision and I am totally not good at that. I mean, for me to articulate an idea <laughs> takes me yeah. half an hour. So, um, so there's that. And um, anyway, I just wanted to put that in there. So here's where we uh, tie it all together and, and introduce your listeners back to Cesar Hidalgo. Um, I think I'll, I'll include in your little footnote section to this video, uh, a link to his Google talk, and then a, a link to his book. I think he might, I think he's from Chile. So he has a, a rather hard accent. So the Google talk sometimes is a bit hard to get through. I found his book fascinating. Um, Michael, one of your interviews recommended it and I read it and it was just like, wow, this guy is great. He starts at the level of entropy and he goes up, um, what I would, you know, through the theory of computation, how ideas are processed, how intelligence is needed to make certain choices, um, the complexity of the choices you can make, the complexity of the technologies you can develop is a function of the intelligence that you can, a community or an individual can bring to bear on the problem. You know, there's to solve a problem, there's relationships, there's things to unravel. So there's always a level of intelligence commensurate with the problem you're trying to solve. And what Cesar Hidalgo points out is the human brain is finite. There's only so much one human can do. And at certain points to solve more complex problems, you have to bring more minds together. You have to start forming this distributed intelligence, distributed computation. So that's that's an idea that's straight out of AI and it's one I'm, I'm familiar with. And Years ago, I, I had a textbook, um, it was called Computational Collective Intelligence. And it, it dealt with how you network uh, computers together to form more um, powerful systems. And one of the things that comes out of that is that you realize that when you network a lot of computers together, you can often end up getting group behaviors out of the network that no individual uh, computational system could accomplish. And so that was that's when the, the whole notion of strong emergence really, you know, hit me in the face was that it's there in front of you. I don't see how people can argue that it, it doesn't exist when you see it actually happen at the at the level of AI. So Caesar takes that notion of, of distributed intelligence in relationship to the problems you can solve and applies it to societies and cultures. And he looks at how large how extended your economy uh, can be how your economy can grow based on the the intelligence the distributed intelligence you could bring to bear on a problem and a lot of that the size of your network is based on what he calls trust um, trust networks are essential for a collective intelligence of the society to come together to be able to push it on a problem one of the factors that you have to have for um, that kind of intelligence, group intelligence to come together in a society to work on a problem 
is you have to have not only the free, free exchange of ideas, which means you need to trust your words and language, but you have to have a free exchange of wealth, which means uh, basically a capitalistic economic system. Um, not that capitalism is always a great idea, but you need some kind of distributed, non-centralized uh, economic system in order for collective consciousness to form up, to create the technologies that you need to grow your economy. So this gets back to Galileo and the, the eyeglasses, that there had to be something going on that allowed the economy to grow, to for allow for distributed intelligence of many people working on a single problem to come together and exchange money to make it worth people's, you know, so they can pay their bills while they work on grinding lenses, things like that. And so I think, so I like Caesar Dalgos because it's, it's economics. It's not social, it's not political, it's not religious. He's, he's brought it down to a pretty grunt basic level that gets rid of a lot of the baggage and then looks at the trust networks at that level. And then you can see how it all plays out in a, in a very obvious fashion. Um, so again, I, um, do you have any questions? I think I've just ran, my brain just went empty there for a second. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to go back and try to transcribe what you just said in the last two or three minutes because I thought it was such a beautiful compilation of that whole idea. Um, and there's so many ideas running through my head that I can't even corral them all. So yeah, well, um, that's my problem. The, the, the strong emergence, uh, you, uh, you were talking about when you network computers together. So the book was Computational Collective Intelligence where they start networking computers together and they end up with group behaviors that no one individual computer would right. be able to manage. Well, you don't have to, you know, people don't have to go on. It's just a textbook from many years ago that it first- Sure, I mean, it's just an idea, but I, I just yeah. wanted to make sure I had the idea right. That when, when you start networking computers together, you get group behaviors that no individual computer can accomplish. Right, and is, we're not even programmed to do. Is, pa is part of that the same idea as what comes out of opponent processing in, in the study of AI, or is that a different thing? I'll say that again. Well, I, my husband took a class in AI last year, and one of the things that they talked about was opponent processing. You get two computers fighting with each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, they're competing with each other. And so they're, they're both given the same data set and they're running it through the, the AI thing. And um, periodically they'll feed some noise into the system and the, the computers will start. And I thought that word was opponent processing. Maybe I got it wrong. Could be. I'm not familiar with all of the, the, the tar jargon, but. Okay. Um, I know, I think I know exactly what he's talking about because that was one of the first things that came up in that textbook I mentioned was that cooperative behaviors don't necessarily have to be cooperative. They could be competitive. And, and one of the examples was uh, the old days of the guilds, you know, all the shoemakers would be in one area and all of the cabinet makers would be in another area. And they might individually be competing against each other for the market share and but yet somehow, even though they're competing together against each other, the technology still can grow. Mm -hmm. So, um, Well, that's the whole a, idea of marketing. Yeah. I mean, to me, when people are so anti-marketing, I'm like, don't you realize that everything that you have today is a result of marketing? Because some guy who was in marketing tried to figure out what would people want that would be better than this, because it always, it's always this competition to get better than what you already have mm -hmm. because they're trying to compete with other companies. So the competition is going on like this, but meanwhile, each company is moving up like this while we're competing mm -hmm. with each other, right? So. Right. Yeah, so I can see where you could talk about uh, competing uh, AI systems actually evolving and, and producing uh, better results. Um, I'm not sure, I'll, I'll look it up as soon as I get off of this. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, one last, 
don't know. Thought when you talked about the truth and how everything's been corrupted, and I have to say one of the problems is that there's there's no element in our society anymore that holds truth sacred. You would think that that the church would be that institution, but it is has abandoned the field, has taken itself out of the game, and I've it's always bothered me that when Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, most, I'd say all the Christians I know, they assume that Jesus' truth is some kind of otherworldly truth, separate from this world, that it's quoting scriptures. But I tend to think that when he said that, he meant truth in all of its forms, you know, historical, mathematical, logic. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't hold truth sacred in all its forms, we end up in the world we're in today. And the church doesn't make an effort to, to make that step. I don't know, I'm not a pastor, I have no idea what, <laughs> what to do with that point of view. I think Jordan Peterson gets it. I suspect that Paul Vanderclay has is, is, is thought about it, but uh, for a good portion of the church, uh, at least uh, I'm familiar with my world, um, pastors seem to avoid getting, in, getting involved in any discussions outside of, of the scriptures and, and some kind of biblical truth. So uh, might I recommend Dallas Willard to you? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll put some, I'll put a link to Dallas Willard's work below because um, he it was he passed away a couple of years ago, but he was a theologian, but also um, a philosopher and um, very interested in the ideas of Husserl mm -hmm. and um, and very interested in the whole area of quantum, the quantum realm, and very tied into this idea about truth mm -hmm. which i didn't realize that about him i i sort of avoided looking at dallas willard because the church that we were in it seemed like almost every message would have a quote from dallas willard and after a while i just thought well who is this guy and why should i care so i almost purposely didn't look at dallas willard because i don't like everything going through the lens of one person. So I never looked into him, but then I started looking into him a couple months ago and I'm like, oh my gosh, no wonder. <laughs> and, and, and also no wonder why I've stayed with that church because that church does tend to focus on the idea that there is truth in all these different fields. Right. It's important, right? And um, so anyway, I think the ideas of Dallas Willard are very interesting. I think I might know who you're talking about and so this is glenn the physicist speaking now not yeah. glenn the guy who goes to church <laughs> a lot of that talk bothers me because they acknowledge science is out there but they try and bend science to justify scripture so i don't think he does I, I, you might be thinking of a different guy but okay yeah. but if, if that's true, then he's unique and he's not someone I ran across. The closest person I, I can think of um, was C.S. Lewis. I think he had enough faith that he could let go of the Bible and go meet the other side. So C.S. Lewis would be someone who could meet with Jordan Peterson and, and, and walk with him. But a lot of, I'd say, well, everybody I've encountered on the physics side, the science side, I don't think has enough faith to just walk, step away from the Bible and walk with Jordan Peterson. So eventually, you know, it's the Bible is like an anchor for most Christians. They will wander a little bit away from it, but they won't cut the cord. Um, and I remember a, a comment I heard years ago was believing is hanging on to a rock in the middle of a fast moving river. Faith is letting go and learning how to swim. So um, I think if you wanna find the truth, you gotta let go and learn how to swim. 
and I'm waiting for someone on, on the church side to, to, to do that. So hopefully that makes sense to, to your listeners. Well, it makes sense to me through one lens. I'm not sure what you're I'm not sure what you're thinking about when you talk about cutting the tie. Um, well, I'll, I'll take it. I'll try a different pathway. You know, you, I've heard sermons. You know, I grew up Lutheran, so we had the church um, calendar. So there's always prescribed text. And then, you know, recent years, the pastors would pick a topic to preach on or mm -hmm. uh, a book out of the Bible to preach on. But if, you went, if I went back to Martin Luther, he saw the scripture as one complete whole, front to back, Old Testament, New Testament, law, gospel. You had to take the, everything all together as one logically consistent chunk. I have not really seen that from the church. But if you look at the Bible, it goes back 1500 BC, who knows, to now. It's a long history. It's not just for us. It's for people who come before, people who come after, for cultures that are absolutely alien to us. There's a big story there. There's something that's important about the whole thing mm -hmm. taken together as one. In order that, you have to stay. Those equations, experiments, but it's physicists always at some point, we have to step out and do the metaphysics. What's the big picture? Why are we doing this? I sense that the Christian faith, no one has been able to do that, to step outside the Bible and say, why is that there? What is it about humans, us, the laws of physics, the universe, human psychology that makes this book important? I think that's what I'm waiting to see. Um, well, and it isn't yeah, that so, Jordan Peterson's project, really? Yes, I, he's onto yes. it, and that's why I find him yeah. fascinating. And I, I feel bad for him because I don't think anyone on the Christian side has figured that out. Yeah. Well, it may be that willing. you, it maybe you haven't been exposed to enough people. I. I had a conversation a while I, back. I can admit that's entirely yeah. possible. I had a conversation a while back with uh, with one of the pastors that I find particularly interesting in the way he approaches things. And I would say he totally gets that. And when I asked him if he had been influenced by Jordan Peterson, he said, who is that? Uh -huh. And so I thought, oh, OK, so he's coming at it from his own direction. Mm -hmm. Jordan Peterson's coming at it from his own direction. And, and I've had the privilege for the last, well, actually for most of my Christian life, I've had the privilege to sit under pastors who saw something about that big picture because they would never take a passage of scripture and teach it and say, this is what it says and this is what you're supposed to do without also saying, Let's look at all the other things around this that go together with that. You can't take any one passage of scripture and lean on that as being the whole truth without looking at all the rest of scripture as well. So that was why I really resonated when Jordan Peterson showed that illustration of, that somebody had put together of all the connections that are in the Bible and all the interconnections and how they starting way back in the old testament the all the hyperlinks that are in the bible yeah. mm -hmm. um i don't think you can ever look at the scripture without realizing those hyperlinks and actually when i was a new believer i was really lucky because the, my very first bible wasn't hyperlinked as a as a like com computational hyperlink but but the Bible was set up so that every verse that when you're reading, you can see all the other verses that it connects to. So you could actually go through the whole thing and try to figure out what is really being said here, because they, those are not small ideas. And they have arisen out of a long history of, of humans trying to figure out what everything is all about, right? Which is one of the reasons why you have to except that the Bible was not human written. 
because no human authors just making up a story could ever come up with that something so interconnected so perfectly. Yeah. And it also talks about a lot of things that no human would ever want to acknowledge. <laughs> Yeah. We don't want we don't want to admit those things about ourselves. So but I, I can believe that I have encountered everybody because I'm pretty much a hands-on kind of guy. So my talking to you is about as far into the intellectual realm as I usually uh, venture. So um, I'm more, since more I am not an intellectual, you haven't <laughs> dug very deep. I'm more comfortable with a soldering iron and a you know, an oscilloscope than I am reading um, books on theology and philosophy. Well, you've obviously thought a lot, Glenn, because once you get started on a thread and you start articulating what you've been thinking about, it all comes out in a very cohesive whole. And uh, I would love, to, if I had the time, I would make transcripts of some of these things and, and try to parse out fill in the pieces that are missing for me, you know, and um, maybe we'll do that with a, with a section of our previous talk. I'll take a little section of it and we'll, we'll do video clips of you talking and then you can respond to yourself. Oh <laughs> I'll go hide in the bathroom for that one. <laughs> this has been great, Glenn. Um, I'm hoping that we get to talk again. And um, I know you were going to, you were going to approach some questions about entropy for me. So we have to do at least one more session on entropy. <laughs> yeah, that's a big subject. And, and that's gonna, it's going to take me some work because you actually ask really hard questions. And I realize I can't give you the standard textbook answers because they're not going to work. So now I have to go back and do my homework and really struggle to come up with some good explanations. Well, and let me, I'm let not me... getting back to you right away. Let me put a little teaser in here too. I'm going to share screen and I'm going to show a couple of illustrations that came out of, you put me onto a, that video again, which we had talked about some time back, but you reminded me again, the one on the Conway Coken theory of free will. And uh, mm -hmm. you still there? Yeah, okay. Yes. So there were a couple of illustrations that were in that yes. video that I think would be so interesting to look at. So I'm just going to share screen and show them. Here's one of them. And uh, we can talk about this in a future video. She was making the point that um, <clears throat> there has to be some space, some additional space beyond what scientists typically take as their framework. Some of them say, oh, everything is absolutely deterministic. And some of them say, no, everything is complete randomness. And some of them say, no, um, there is a complete self-determination. And she said, there's got to be some space in between those. And this was one of the pictures that she had of, of all of the yes. past, um, all of the past sort of branches that come together into this moment of now when I'm confronted with a future choice. And this is what my future choices look like, this branching of possibilities. And then the other Your one that, is a yes, no decision. Yeah, and then the other one that she showed, um, let me see if I can find it in here. This one, the, the past light cone and the future light cone. Um, are our decisions influenced by that which is in the past light cone or our decisions only influence from this moment going forward, that would be one of the determinants of whether something is free will or not, I think. Uh, I have a blank screen right now. Oh, really? Okay, sorry. Um, I don't know why that happened. I should be, huh, because I am on share screen. Well, sorry about that. Anyway. It's a picture of two light cones. So um, I want to talk about those two things when we talk about entropy. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> because I think, I think it's all tied up somehow, and I'm going to put this marker in here. I think it's all tied up somehow with 
time as a boundary for space and um, this connection somehow of, we talked last time about how in the quantum world, there really, you could say that there is no, there are no boundaries in the quantum world and, and there's no time and space in the quantum world. But in, in our world, when, like Jordan Peterson talks about at this level of analysis where we are this messy middle, then time and space and boundaries and all of those things get wound up in there. So that's what I wanna talk about next time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You have a great weekend. Yes, same to you. I look forward to talking to you soon. Okay. Bye. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.